What happened that, what were the circumstances that led up to you being wounded? <clears throat> well, uh, once the division reached the Po Valley, the Germans were in pretty much a state of disorganization. And we moved very, very fast. And the general ordered another general to take Task Force Duff by truck and jeep and motor vehicle as fast as possible to a little town with a bridge called Bomporto. Uh, general Duff did that. The second day, my battalion took over for the battalion that he had the first day, and we went from there up to the Po River. And just before the Po River, I, uh, I always thought that we were leading that group, but I can't say for sure. <coughs> we had three little light tanks ahead of us, and then there was the Colonel and me and the Colonel's Jeep. Well, as the third light tank w went around the corner, we came to a dead end. We had to go left or right. And as the third light tank went around the corner, it just disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Well, we thought, boy, that's not healthy going around that corner. And so we stopped just short of the corner and got out and uh, moved to a ditch about, oh, let's say 10, 20 feet from the Jeep. And while we were standing there, a German anti-tank weapon called a Panzerfaust, that was the equivalent of our bazooka, was fired at the Jeep. <clears throat> and uh, it exploded, of course, and ruined the Jeep. But in the process, it wounded all three of us that had been in the Jeep. It broke both of my eardrums, and my left side was hit with lots of little pieces of shrapnel. Uh, since the war, the broken eardrums have been the biggest problem. <coughs> but uh, that was how we got wounded, how I got wounded, and the colonel got wounded, and a fellow named Perkins, who was the driver, also got wounded. All of us lived through it. The uh, colonel, he had kind of a spence, sense of drama about him, you know. And after the explosion, we were both pretty woozy. He said, I can't make it, Jim. I can't make it. He kind of liked to say that. He said it several times during the war. Uh, and I said, the hell you can't. You don't normally talk to a colonel that way, but in that case, it was all right. I said, the hell you can't. Crawl down that ditch. And so we did crawl down the ditch away from the enemy. And finally, we got to a farmhouse uh, far enough back where we climbed out and, uh, and got into the farmhouse where there were some medics working on other people and who, they then worked on us. Well, the funny thing about it was that we both spent about three weeks in the hospital till they released us. By that time, uh, my ears were no longer ringing, but of course the broken eardrums affected my hearing. But the shrapnel wounds, they had cut them open and they had pretty well healed up. But the one thing that still hurt like the Dickens was our hands and our knees. And I couldn't figure that out until later when someone told me that we had been crawling through a ditch that was full of nettles, those little, you know, pointed things that stick into you, and they stuck into our hands, and they stuck into our knees, and boy, they hurt for weeks afterwards. So of, of all the wounds we got, uh, the nettles were probably the most long-lasting pain. Another thing that was really interesting to me is that when you get wounded, the first place they take you to is normally called a collecting station. And a collecting station has medics. And uh, Nate Morrell was one of the medics in the collecting station that collected me. Well, there were about six or eight others in that collecting station, including a couple of Germans. And the German had been hurt quite badly in, in the Battle for Leningrad. <coughs> he has left leg had a terrible scar on it and even at that time he had another wound to his other leg that was pretty nasty but uh, he bore up pretty well and I spoke pretty good German in fact many times I talked to the German prisoners uh, gave them commands interrogated them uh, and so on and uh, so uh, I told him about our experience 
and, and I said that we were standing in a ditch and a Panzerfaust hit our Jeep. And he said, yeah, das habe ich gemerkt, which means, yeah, I noticed that. And then uh, I said a couple of other things, and I forget what they were now, but yeah, das habe ich gemerkt. Well, it finally dawned on me that that was the son of a gun that fired that, that Panzerfaust that hit our Jeep. But I couldn't feel really bad at him because if he had fired at us, he would have killed us. The Jeep was about 20 feet away and we weren't killed. A Panzerfaust and a bazooka, the, the round that it fires is shaped in such a way that most of the force will go straight ahead. It'll puncture a hole in a tank and then the, the piece of the tank ricochets around or, and kills the people in the tank. So most of the force from this Panzerfaust had gone right straight ahead, which was sideways to us, not at us. And uh, that saved us from being killed, uh, even though we were that close. But if he had fired at us, he would have killed us. And uh, so I couldn't feel too bad about it. And then another thing about that collecting station was that it was in a wine factory. And there were dozens of gigantic casks, floor to ceiling casks of wine. And the medics, you know, they had good training. They brought around all the different kinds of wine to us. And uh, we were cured long before the ambulance arrived. Of course, when it wore off, we were sick again. But, but uh, that was kind of fun, and Nate remembers that. I'll have to bring that up to Nate. Yeah. How many lives do you think you used up? A lot. A lot. <clears throat> Many times, that occasion was one. Many other times, a foot here, or a foot there, or a minute here, or a minute there, could have gotten me killed or badly wounded. And just by luck, I didn't move the foot, or I did move the foot, or I didn't move, or I did move, and then a shell or some heavy fire came in where I had been. So. How many lives did I use up? Lots. Were you fighting, were you mad at the Germans or were you just doing your, or did you feel a sense of duty? I wasn't mad at them. When I was trying to kill that sniper, I felt no anger and no hatred, but I also felt no remorse at killing him. It's what I was supposed to do. And unfortunately, my carbine misfired. Otherwise, he would have been dead right then and there. But I, I didn't feel any hatred. Later, when I captured him, I drove him to cover. I captured him and the other Germans who had been hiding in the bunkers. They were not fighting. Only one German was fighting. And I didn't know which one he was, but I didn't really care. Uh, they were our prisoners, and, uh, and we let it go at that. We took them back. The medics, who were dog-tired at that time, used them to help carry litters with the wounded, and, uh, and they did it very well. Germans were very, very well trained, and if you ordered them to do something, they would do it to the best of their ability. So they helped the medics a great deal. I remember one time at Camp Swift, I think, they shipped, for some reason, German tri uh, prisoners to Camp Swift. They had a prison there. Well, we wanted them to cut the grass around the, the building that they were living in, but we had nothing for them to cut with. And what do these Germans do? With their bare hands, they go out and they start cutting that grass with their bare hands. I mean, most of them were fine soldiers, and I'm sure they were fine guys. Uh, that's my opinion. Other Americans hated them. Some Americans, I'm sure, shot prisoners in cold blood, just as the Germans did. But I never saw that. Um, when you think about what it is that you wish you know, your kids would know about what you've done that they don't already know, what would it be? Well, <clears throat> I would, I would like to have them appreciate the fact that I and all of the other combat soldiers 
we didn't do it. We didn't kill for the pleasure of it. We did it because it was our job. And I would like the kids to feel that the 10th Mountain Division, in a small way, contributed to the victory over Nazi Germany, which I am convinced today, and even more so than I was during the war, was just about the most evil empire in existence during our lifetime. And I feel that getting rid of that was something that, that I would like the kids to appreciate. And a lot of them do. I have had many young people come up to me when they found out that I was in either the 10th Mountain Division or the military. And they <clears throat> said, sir, I just want you to know that we appreciate what you did. Well, that's very meaningful. It can almost bring tears to your eyes to have these young kids, 20, 25, 30 years old, come up to you and say, we appreciate what you did. And that's what I would like my children to feel. And I think my, my daughter died a while back, but I think my son is beginning to feel it more and more. When you were um, leading in battle, did you feel a certain sense of responsibility to get all those kids back alive? No. <clears throat> you felt a responsibility to take the objective. And you had confidence that they had been trained well enough to do all they could to stay alive. And they did. With an infantry soldier, <coughs> the ground is his greatest friend. And all of these men, they could hit the ground so fast that it's a wonder they didn't make a dent. They could hear, a and they were on the ground. And if there was a little bit of cover here, a little bit of cover there, they were behind that cover, behind that rock, in that ditch, uh, behind that tree. And so the leader was interested in fulfilling, fulfilling the mission, but he knew his men would do the very best they could to stay alive. embodies some of the spirit of the original tent? It's amazing to me. They're young. <clears throat> they don't really know us. They only know a little bit about what was told to them. But they almost worship us. I mean, it's a feeling that uh, of gratitude that I have, and I think most of the guys have, how can these strong young men and women have such a strong feeling about us? So it's really wonderful that they do. Uh, and as I told you, when I went to that reunion up at Fort Drum, a colonel was carrying my suitcases for me. Well, that's the first time a first lieutenant ever had a colonel carry suitcases for him. I'm damn sure of that. They couldn't do enough for us. Anything we wanted, if possible, they would do it. So. Our feeling towards, my feeling towards the new 10th, the light, 10th light, incidentally, they're going to give that name up, uh, is one of great admiration. They have done a fine job in many difficult areas around the world. They have upheld our traditions. They have performed nobly. And we have nothing but the greatest of respect for them in return for which we have great respect from them. It's a wonderful feeling. Well, you may have seen an article <clears throat> that I wrote for the Blizzard a couple of times ago thanking the descendants for their response. Uh, Pat Thornton told them that I had terminal cancer. Eighty-two of those young people wrote to me. They sent a get well card. They sent a religious card of blessings. They sent a little note. I mean, the uh, it was... surprised? Well, it was so moving that even now I'm emotional. To think young people like you, busy, 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 
would take time to write an old fart like me. Uh, I can't tell you how much it impressed me. And uh, all the way through, we've had that kind of loyal support from the descendants and the Tenth Light. <coughs> how was it that you engineered the, the evolution of the descendants? Like, since you were sort of the founding father of the descendants, can you talk a little bit about how you were that force? And yeah. Uh, can I take a sip of the water? Yeah, sure. Uh, without my work, there wouldn't be any descendant organization. Uh, she joined it because of me, and I mentioned that Jill Hahn did, and several of the others did. And the way it all started was that Bill Boddington, who was president of the Tenth Foundation for many, many years, did a wonderful job, a very loyal Tenth man, suggested to the Foundation that we start a descendant organization uh, to which only direct descendants of the Tenth Veterans would belong. Now, I think they've expanded that some, and I see nothing wrong with that. But anyway, I was the chairman of a committee that was to investigate the idea and then report back to the foundation whether or not we thought it was practical. And we had several long meetings, and uh, we had a lot of reservations. There was a lot of resistance to it. A lot of the guys had no interest whatsoever, that is, the veterans. Uh, the Eastern establishment, as we call them, which is the leaders in the eastern part of the country, were diametrically opposed to it. <coughs> and uh, there were a lot of other problems, chief of which was that if we started a group <coughs> and put these descendants in the foundation, then what were they members of? Were they members of the association? Were they members of the foundation? Were they members of both? What dues would they pay? Who would they pay to? And so on. And that was an overwhelming problem. Well, it wasn't long before I realized that wasn't going to work. So at Sun Valley, I proposed to the National Board of Directors that the National Association adopt what we call then the Order of Belvedere. And they approved it. Speed Murphy made the motion to approve it. And everybody except one voted aye. And so at that point, the descendants were members of a very special group within the association. It was not a separate group like it is now. It was members of the association, which was exactly what I wanted and exactly what we had to have. Because if you try to set up a separate group from Denver and no local contacts for any of those descendants, you're not going to get them. And it was actually tried. Hugh Evans tried it a few years before, and it failed because they tried to set it up as a separate group. <clears throat> so when the National Association adopted the responsibility, it immediately burgeoned because all those young people had a local chapter that they belonged to. They had meetings that they could go to. They had entertainment that they could go to. And they felt that they belonged. They could socialize with the veterans and with other descendants. And uh, almost immediately, the membership started to climb. It also covered our ass, so to speak, uh, because the law of the IRS, and being a CPA, I've always been fully aware of that, was that the descendants could not be members of the association. So by creating this auxiliary within the association, we could have argued, if ever questioned, well, look, we set up an auxiliary, and there it is. You can see plain as day. It was formally approved. These descendants belong to an auxiliary. Well, the IRS would have said, yeah, okay, they do, but the auxiliary is not supposed to be separate. They can't be members. And we would have said, oh, really? Uh, and then at that point, we would have taken steps. They would have given us the chance to correct it, taken steps to separate them as we did at Fort Drum. But fortunately, that never happened so that for three years, I, I suppose I worked every day, almost every day, somewhere between an hour and eight hours per day, trying to build the membership within the association. And by the time we got to Fort Drum, 
we had 550 members. So that when the, when the auxiliary was separated as it should have been all along, they had 550 members to work with and that has proven to be adequate strength and I think now we, it depends a lot what time of year you measure it because it depends on the dues. But I think right now we could count seven or eight hundred dues paying members. And that's wonderful because from 550 to 800 is a nice increase in that period of time. And with any luck, uh, it'll go up still. And I am pressuring John Duffy and all of the chapter presidents to get more active promoting membership in the descendants. I feel that they could and should do more. And uh, I still haven't, I haven't called out all my guns, <clears throat> but I intend to. And uh, I will call each one of the presidents personally or write to them and just badger them until they start to do more, which is what it took in the first place. You can't call somebody and say, do this. They won't do it. But you call them five or six times and say, oh my God, that guy's on the phone again. Get rid of him. And so they'll do, you know, they'll do what you want. Uh, and that's how it worked. And in a lot of the chapters, I had wonderful help from the presidents. In some cases, they appointed a chapter, a chairman of the descendants. Uh, the blizzard, uh, oh heck, I can't come up with his name right. And Ray Zelina was a wonderful help he published. Uh, years ago, I read a story about, uh, I think it was John D. Rockefeller who had a steel operation. And in the steel plant, they produced at night what they called heats. And the heat was uh, uh, the heat of one oven, which they then poured out, started another, and so on. And uh, if it wasn't Rockefeller, it was one of those other great guys, U.S. Steel. And he wrote on the floor in chalk six, which meant that the night before that group had produced six heats. The next day he came by and six was crossed out and eight was written there because the guys on that shift were not going to get beaten by that other one. Well, I don't know how high they get up to, but I think it got up to 10 or 12 shifts. So I used the blizzard to engender comp uh, comp uh, competition between the chapters. And every blizzard I would publish the number of new members that that chapter had gotten. And that worked pretty well too. So it was a matter of, of pushing, pulling, needling, badgering uh, until they got on the ball and brought in new members. And that's why we had 550 when we reached Fort Drum. Can you think of anything else that later on you wish you would have said? Like, do, do you feel like we talked enough about your war experiences? Probably. Yeah. I can't think of anything <coughs> major that I should add. Uh, to that. Uh, there was a couple of things in training that were very, very educational. And that was this, that when you're in cold weather, and we were in 30 degree below zero temperatures, and during the hikes we would sweat, and our clothing would get wet. Well, when you went to bed in that temperature, the temptation was to just keep on everything you had, but we didn't do it. We took off the jackets, we took off a lot of our clothing, some, I guess, even took off all of their clothing. We left the socks and the underwear inside the sleeping bag. And then we slept either nude or in our underwear. And we hung the clothing out on branches. Well, the jackets in particular, the next morning, were frozen solid. And so, in order to get into them, you had to bang them and crush them and get them loosened up enough so you could climb into them. And then your body heat would soften them up within a few minutes. So staying dry is incredibly important in real low temperatures. And the other thing that I learned on D-Series was the importance of food. You would think that would be kind of obvious, but you don't think too much about it. <clears throat> but on Easter Sunday, 
I was climbing with my ski patrol up Ptarmigan Mountain. And we were on the backside, and we were not exposed to so-called enemy fire. But every step was sheer agony for me. I could hardly put one foot in front of the other. And the minute we had a break, I would fall fast asleep. So when we got to the top of the mountain, the, the colonel said, Jim, take your ski patrol over to Vail Pass. So even though I was totally exhausted, I had headed over towards Vail Pass, uh, leading the patrol. And my radio operator, and we had a fairly big operator, I mean a fairly big pack, uh, he was more exhausted than me, I guess. So I took the pack from him and carried it. <clears throat> so I was leading the patrol over towards Vail Pass. When we got word on the radio that the, the exercise had ended. So we turned around, and at that point, instead of leading, I was at the tail end of the column. At one point during that march back, <coughs> I fell down and fell sound asleep instantly. And I would have died there happy as a clam if the guys hadn't come back. You know, so where's the lieutenant? And, they came back and there I'm sound asleep. So then we got back to the assembly area and they gave me some hot cocoa and something else. And do you know, it was like adrenaline. Suddenly my body just felt all that strength come back because the furnace was completely empty and once it had something to burn, it was going fine. And so within just a few minutes having hot cocoa and something to eat, I felt pretty strong again after feeling totally exhausted. So the lesson from that, of course, is if you're in cold weather in the mountains, you have to eat something. And uh, it was a, mess, a lesson I'll never forget. I may never have to use it again, but I'll never forget it. You can't imagine the exhaustion, totally exhausted. And the medic, the, uh, the wounded man was gray. I mean, he looked dead. And the medic was holding a bottle up, giving him plasma. And while I watched, the color came back into this man's face. And he became alive again. And I never will forget that, because here was a dead man, and the medic brought him back to life with plasma. You know what plasma is? Uh, uh, that made a big impression on me. I suppose there were other combat experiences that I could remember, but I... Go back to Mount Dulles Bay. Were you on Mount Dulles Bay? Yeah. Why don't you, let's talk See, about that a little more. As, as the S-2, now I wasn't in the attacking battalion. By the time I got there, I really think it was a company from the 3rd Battalion that took it. And if I had to guess, I would say that it was L Company of the 85th because uh, the captain, later he was a captain, complained that nobody from battalion headquarters was up there with him. But I was up there every day because as the S-2, I was responsible for observation of the enemy. And we set up observation posts. And they had to be at the extreme front line. But in Dallas Bay, they were even ahead of the front line because that's where we had to be in order to get good observation. So I, uh, I had a S-2 section that set up the observation post. And then I went up and I visited them every day. We talked about various things and observed and see if there was anything we could report significant. And there never was very much. And I got a little careless. Uh, the men had dug a trench going out to the observation post. It was covered, very nice one. But I walked out in the open. And about the second or third day that I did that, wham, a German shell comes in, just barely misses me and lands 
in the hillside behind me. And I can just picture some German sitting there with his cannon, probably a 75, saying, that son of a bitch, I can't let him walk like that out in the open. Please, officer, let me fire just one shot at him. And, uh, and he did. So uh, I got a big kick out of that because he didn't hit me. But after that, I did crawl through the trench because I didn't want to endanger me or the men. And you didn't want to use up another one of your nine lives? No, that was one that I used up right there. Another one I used up later was <clears throat> when they were attacking Della Taraccia, we were in reserve. But you can never tell when you're going to be called upon to move up and take over for the attacking troops. So as the S2, it was my job to keep up to date on where the enemy were, what they were doing, and if we did have to move up, to be able to lead the battalion to the right place <coughs> so they could take over and continue the attack. So I did go up there, and uh, I contacted the lead troops who were attacking, and there was a nice hill to my left, uh, maybe two, three hundred feet higher than where I was, and I climbed up in the open. It was just as open as this grass here. And right at the top is a beautiful foxhole. Obviously, the Germans had bought, had dug a beautiful foxhole right at the top of this mountain. So I dropped in that and was observing where our troops were, where the enemy were, and so on, <clears throat> when a shell landed about 100 yards in front of me, which is nothing to worry about. But then another shell landed about 50 yards in front of me, right in line with my hole. And then another shell landed about 25 yards right in front of me, right in line with my hole. And by that time, I got the message that they didn't like having me in that spot. And so I ran down the hill, and I jumped into a horizontal slit trench, which was in the edge of the woods, and I jumped in for cover. <clears throat> and the guy below me, there was a guy below me, he said, hi, Lieutenant, welcome. And then another guy below him said, stay as long as you want to, Lieutenant. We were three deep in this thing, and I was the top one. So that's kind of a funny story, too. How long did you stay? I don't remember exactly. Uh, I don't know, maybe five, ten minutes till the shelling eased up a little bit. And then they kept going, and I went back to the colonel. The colonel gave me hell. He said, where you been? I said, well, I was up with the attacking troops. I figured it'd be a good thing to know where they were. He said, well, you stay with me. Well, the full colonel, who was a regimental commander, said right in front of my commander, well, that sounds like a good idea to me. <coughs> but <coughs> my commander didn't buy it. <coughs> or if he did, he still wanted me with him. He needed your eyes and ears. Well... Uh, to, a, to a large extent, when I was not at an observation post, I was with him. And he used me to do different things. For example, when we moved into the Po Valley, the advancing troops moved ahead of us. And the colonel and I went up in his jeep to locate a position to move the battalion into on the edge of the Po Valley. Well, he sent me back to bring up the battalion. So I took my Jeep. I had a Jeep and a driver assigned to me. And we drove on back and we found the troops. And they were kind of at the top of a little hill in sparse forest. And I said, all right, the colonel wants you to move up now. Well, they had a little debate. The assistant battalion commander, who was a major at that time, and the company commanders debated on just how they would move up. And the decision was that a couple of the companies would drop down. There was a steep drop of the hill to a road that was well below the top of that hill. But L Company would move along the slope of the hill. <clears throat> the L Company got out there in the middle of that wide open area. And the Germans, they were high enough up so the Germans could see them. And shells began to land right in the middle of them. And that, I'm convinced, is where Freddie Finn, Pat Thornton's father, was killed. 
uh, I don't, well, I guess that's, that's all. Anyway, uh, one of the officers, Green Cognac, uh, forget his name, but he, he wrote saying that the shelling beheaded uh, Captain Finn. Finn had been with us, then he left, and then he came back. He'd only been with us a week or so before he got killed. And, uh, but that wasn't true. <coughs> he was not beheaded. And uh, <coughs> he crawled quite a long distance before he died, which made me very angry because I felt that his troops should have noticed his absence and sent back for him. Uh, or at least some medics, but they didn't. And I hid that from Pat for a long time. I never did tell her mother, uh, but Pat knows it, and she knows that this guy's story was full of baloney. But that's, so anyway, then we got to the head of the valley, and these shells were landing like popcorn all along the ridge in front of us, and the K Company captain froze. I mean, he just stopped. So I drove, he was in the lower level, I drove up to him and I said, Captain Cooper, we've got to get these troops moving. I said, now I'm going to move out and be sure that your men follow me because I'm sure the colonel will be very disappointed if they don't. So my driver and I, we drove out, drove up, the shells were exploding along the ridge, but they were exploding just high enough so they couldn't reach us. And so then K Company followed and the other companies fell in and followed, and we got all of them to the assembly area where the colonel was waiting for us. So it was, uh, uh, it was an awful thing as far as Freddie's concerned, and nothing I can do about it, nothing anybody can do about it, but I do wish somebody had sent back for him they might have saved him. I don't know. Now, I suppose, describe what the chaos of battle is like. Well, it's just plain confusion. In training, you operate with a squad, squad leader, and the squad leader directs the squad here, there, and everywhere. But, and that may still work in some cases. But in an awful lot of cases, the thing is so confused that nobody, particularly at night, nobody knows where anybody is. And so each individual man is leading that group. And for that reason, quite a few of the men think they were the first men to reach the top of Mount Belvedere because in their group, they were the first. But <clears throat> the confusion is so great that uh, in fact, all combat depends on a few brave guys that are willing to move out, to lead, to risk their necks, and to lead the way for the other guys. So that night it's even more so, I would say. But combat is just confusion, and that's all there is to it. Can you think of anything else? I have about two minutes of tape left. Well, I, I've got what I think is a neat story that's personal, not connected with the division. <clears throat> Gene and I moved up to Glenwood Springs in the fall of uh, 43, because the trip up to camp was very difficult in the winter. And uh, on one of those weekends, everybody was going deer hunting. I said, well, I guess I'll go deer hunting. So I, I got a rifle. And uh, I told Colonel Woolley, who was the, the battalion leader of the 1st Battalion, I said, I'm going out to get a deer this weekend. He said, Lieutenant, don't tell me that. You'll be lucky if you see a deer. So anyway, uh, John Montaigne, the fellow who was corresponding with Charlie McLean and who got me into the outfit, uh, had been hunting and he got a deer. And he went on the backside of Snowmass. And he went to a farmer there 
who was very, very nice and helpful. And he, the farmer said, sure, we'll take you up onto the mountain and you ought to get a deer. So he did the same for me. And he loaded me and several of his men onto a pickup truck and we went about halfway up the backside of Snowmass. At that point, they all climbed out and I continued up to the top because by that time, we had been so indoctrinated in getting to the top that, that you just did it without thinking. So I climbed all the way to the top and shortly, it sounded like a war going on, bang, 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 bang down below me. And pretty soon, a whole bunch of deer came up to where I was. And a nice five point buck stood there looking at me. Well, he shouldn't have done that <clears throat> because with one shot, I killed him easily. And the total elapsed time I would say was 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. Well, when I told Colonel Willie that, it's, he would have court-martialed me if there was any law that allowed it, because to think that I went out and in 30 minutes I had a deer, that was uh, he could more than he could handle. Anyway, the, the nice farmer came up with his pack horse. I gutted the deer and cleaned it out, and he helped me load it onto the pack horse, and we took it down to his farm. And there his wife and my wife had prepared a gorgeous dinner with homemade ice cream and everything. And I had a little yellow convertible with a rumble seat. And we put the deer in the rumble seat. So here is the deer sitting up in the rumble seat, looking around like this, you know, as, as if he was a passenger. So we drive back to Glenwood Springs. And my God, the way the people looked at us, they thought we were crazy. Because here's this deer sitting in the back seat looking like a king of all he surveyed.